before I introduce myself, I want to take a moment just to remember and acknowledge and honor the Gabrielino Tongva tribe and the Serrano tribe. These were the tribes who have been lied to, they've been oppressed, they've been moved, they've been put into missions, and they've been even, uh, a few of these tribes have been uh, not acknowledged as uh, full recognized tribes within the U.S. And these were the people who lived here before the city was built, before this college was built, and before uh, both uh, Spanish and American settlers moved in. And I think it's good to remember that we are not standing on land that was discovered. We are standing on land that was inhabited, that was taken care of, that was lived in, and it's just good to remember that. Yat e bene, Mark Charles Yinish, yeah? Sin beke denan the shlim to toy glini bashachin, sin beke denan bashache do toy to cheat ni bashanella. In the Navajo culture, when you introduce yourself, you always give your four, tri your four clans. We're a matrilineal people, so we identify ourselves by our mother's mother. My mother's mother is actually American of Dutch heritage, and so when I introduce myself, I say, Sin Bake Dene which translated means I'm from the Wooden Shoe Clan. <laughs> my father's mother, my second clan, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sin Bake Dene, and my fourth clan, my father's father, is Todachitni, which is the Bitterwater Clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo tribe. Now, if you follow me on Facebook and you, you, uh, you follow me on social media, you know that I love Chipotle burritos. <laughs> and most people get something wrong when they make and eat their Chipotle burrito. So a Chipotle burrito is the best, not when you first make it and you unwrap it and you eat it. A, chole, a, a chipotle burrito is the best when you take the burrito, you put it in the bag, and you carry it around for about 15, 20 minutes. And you allow the sour cream to melt and the salsa to mix, and it goes with the rice, and the, 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 the marinade from the steak kind of gets in there. And then, about a half hour later, you take it out of the bag. It's not piping hot, but it is delicious because it has marinated, everything has mixed together, and you have an incredibly good burrito. It's a secret. Scripture is much the same way. And I want to share with you a passage from Scripture that has been marinating in my soul for about almost 20 to 25 years. It was in 1992 that I first studied this passage. And I have pondered it, I have prayed upon it, I have reflected on it, I have looked at it, and I have tried to live into it for the past 25 years. And I want to share with you a few reflections of the things that I've seen and that I've observed from this passage from Mark chapter 6. So Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 7, it says, Calling the twelve to him, he, Jesus, sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. We're going to skip a few verses and go down to verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. 
Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave it to the disciples to set before the people, and he also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethesda, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on the mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Let me pray for us a moment. Creator, there was a beautiful sunrise that came up over the horizon this morning. We thank you for another day, another gift of life. Another day to walk on this land, to take care of this garden, to live with one another. Another day to know you and to seek after you and to understand better who you are. Father, I thank you for your scripture. I thank you for everybody in this room. I pray that you will pour out your spirit upon us, that you will bless the words of my mouth and that you will open up our hearts and take the veils off our eyes that we may see you more clearly this morning. May your will be done, not our own, Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you haven't figured this out yet, we live in a country that is obsessed with power. It can't stop talking about it. Not a day goes by where someone from our government doesn't remind us that we've created the most powerful military in the history of the world. Not a day goes by where someone from the finance sector doesn't remind us that we have created the most wealthy, prosperous nation and financial system in the history of the world. Power is defined as the ability to act. You have muscle, you have strength, so you can lift something up. Power is defined as the ability to act. When you listen to our politicians, when you listen to our finance leaders, what you will never or rarely hear them talk about is authority. Authority is defined as the right of jurisdiction, the permission to act. We have a ton of power as a nation, but we have absolutely no authority. What would happen to our influence around the world if suddenly we lost our military and our financial system went bankrupt? Who would listen to the United States of America? Almost nobody. Why? Because we have a ton of power, but we have almost no authority. Now, if you've heard me talk in other lectures, you know that since Constantine, for almost 2,000 years, the church has been prostituting itself out to the empire and has become very colonial at its roots. And the church lives in this same mentality, the same paradigm of power that the world lives in. Now, power, the way power is effective is if you demonstrate it. So why does the world listen to us? Well, because we're the only country in the world to drop nuclear bombs on civilians in warfare. This is why they listen to us. We have demonstrated that we are not afraid to pay off people to get our way around the world. We have demonstrated very clearly our power. What was the mantra at the start of the first Iraq war? 
shock and awe. What did we drop on Syria just a few months ago? Was it a bomb? No, it was the mother of all bombs. We are absolutely obsessed with our power and we demonstrate it all around the world. But we have very, very, very little authority to do the things we want to do. And the churches have bought into this mentality in much the same way. And it's because we've been trained through our colonial mindset to think about the Bible and to read the scriptures incorrectly. We think about Jesus as if he were this powerful, almighty being. But if you read the scriptures, and especially I want to look at the Gospel of Mark this morning, if you read the scriptures, Jesus almost did, he did very little out of his power. Yes, he had all power and all authority, but most of the way he acted was through his authority, not through his power. So at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus walks into the synagogue and he begins teaching. And people are amazed at him. Why? Because he didn't teach like the scribes and the teachers of the law, he taught as one who had authority. The scribes and the teachers of the law, they had this bibliography. According to Rabbi so-and-so, let me tell you this. According to, school, uh, according to school such and such, let me tell you this. Jesus stands up and says things like, well, you've heard it was said this, but let me tell you what we were thinking when we wrote that down. <laughs> Jesus doesn't talk like someone who studied scripture. He talked like someone who wrote it. And that absolutely freaked people out. Who's had a conversation with someone who read a good book? Who's had a conversation with someone who wrote a good book? Two completely different conversations. Jesus gets confronted by a demon in the same synagogue, and with authority, he speaks to the demon, and it leaves. See, power needs to be demonstrated. Authority, the right of jurisdiction, the permission to act, you don't have to demonstrate it. Authority is inherent. You have it or you don't, and you don't need to prove it. So Jesus, when he goes to the wedding at Cana, what do people go home amazed by? They don't go home amazed that he turned water into wine. They go home amazed because these hosts save their best wine for last. Why? Because when Jesus turned the water into wine, what did he say? There were a few servants and his mother in the room, and he said, shh, don't tell anybody. He wasn't trying to demonstrate his power. He was exercising his authority. When he's on the boat with his disciples, and he's taking a nap, and some of his disciples are very experienced fishermen. And the storm comes up, and the boat starts taking on water. Now, I think we misread this scripture very frequently because we think the disciples came to Jesus afraid. I don't think they were afraid. These are experienced fishermen, and there is a man during an all-hands-on-deck sleeping. I think they're coming up and saying, Jesus, I don't care who your daddy is. Grab a bucket. Don't you care if we die? And Jesus, he's, you gotta love the guy. He always looks out, takes, assesses the situation. He's like, wind, calm down. Waves, be still. Immediately, it goes silent. Then we're told the disciples were terrified. <laughs> Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They've never seen anything like this. Jesus goes up to Jairus' house, right? There's all these professional mourners and carrying on. There's a ruckus people going on because an important man's uh, child has died. And Jesus comes up and he looks around. And he says, oh, she's not dead. She's asleep. The people laugh at him. Ha <laughs> you're an idiot. He goes into the room, kicks everybody out except the mother, the father, and his three disciples. Peter, James, and John. Then he walks over to her. He raises her from the dead. He feeds her. And then what does he say? Shh, don't tell anybody. So five minutes later, they walk out. What do the people assume? Oh, we're the idiots. We can't tell the difference between a dead girl and a sleeping one. You have to watch Jesus closely. He's not running around demonstrating his power. He's exercising his authority. 
the teachers of the law, the end of the gospels, they come to Jesus and they demonstrate your power, show us your power, do a miracle and we'll believe you. He says, no, I don't play that game. Jesus is this guy who's operating out of authority. He doesn't have to prove anything to anyone. He would show his tax returns in an instant. He doesn't have to prove anything. He's not afraid. Now, that was a bit of an ad-lib there. Now, in this passage, Jesus calls his disciples to them. And he gives them authority to cast out demons. He sends them out to preach and to heal the sick. And what does he say to them? What's the first thing he says to them? Take nothing with you. No money, no wallet, nothing. Go out with nothing. He is literally sending people out to pray for their daily bread. Now, who here has ever prayed for their daily bread? I'm not talking about you need it, you're running low on food or you're almost out of money. I'm talking you wake out, your fridge is empty, your cupboards are bare, there's nothing in your bank account and nothing coming in the mail. Who has ever prayed for their daily bread? Now, you know the temptation when you are literally praying for your daily bread that it is so hard to slip into survival mode and it is almost impossible to think about serving the needs of others. But Jesus sends his disciples out literally to pray for their daily bread every morning and he says, while you're on your knees, pray for and then stand up and seek to serve and meet the needs of those around you. Now, we have it all backwards in the church. We have this belief that says, if you ever pray for your daily bread, it's because you've messed up or you've sinned or you've done something wrong. I preach on our reservations all the time. We didn't even talk about the Great Recession because we have 50% unemployment in a good year. End of the month, everyone is praying for their daily bread. Everybody's on a fixed income. And I tell our congregations, you have a faith, a head and shoulders above every other missionary that's ever come here because you regularly, we regularly pray for our daily bread and they have never done it. There's a whole nother side of God and Jesus that you see and experience when you actually pray for your daily bread. So he sends his disciples out with nothing. This is like the first episode of Survivor. <laughs> Go out with nothing. Now they come back, and the first thing we have to note is, A, they're not dead, so something worked. They've eaten, apparently. And now they've been so busy casting out demons, healing the sick, and preaching the word that they have followers. And there's all these people milling around, and everyone's around and wanting to do more and see more and hear more. And they're so busy, they don't even have time to eat. So Jesus says, okay, guys, let's go away and cross the lake and get a little bit of a rest. So they jump in the boat and they cross the lake, but there's a flaw to this plan, which is it's a pretty small lake. So they go across the lake, but the people are so excited, they run around the lake and beat them there. <laughs> now, you can imagine the dismay in the disciples' eyes as they pull up to the shore. They're tired, they want some rest, they want some time with their master, and they know what's going to happen. And sure enough, the people are there, they're like sheep without a shepherd, and Jesus goes into his teaching mode. They wait an appropriate amount of time, Middle of the afternoon, they come up and say, oh, Jesus, it's late, and uh, the people are hungry, so you should send them away. There's villages they can go to. They need to get something to eat. He said, oh, you're right. They are hungry. You feed them. This is, this is empty. I'm maxed out. I have nothing. It would take eight months of a man's wages. They immediately go back to power. We don't have enough power to feed them. It would take eight months of a man's wages. Do you want us to spend that on bread to go and feed them? Jesus says, well, what do you have? They go out, they find this kid, they shake him down. <laughs> Come back with his lunch. This is like a Lunchable, you know. Well, we got five loaves and two fish, Jesus. This isn't even enough for Peter to eat. I mean, come on. Now, Jesus takes this and he looks up to heaven and he doesn't pray a whiny prayer. God, we have this little food and this many people. He thanks God for it. 
And then he breaks the bread and passes it out. He breaks the fish and passes it out. And there's so much food that everybody's satisfied, and the disciples pick up a basket full each. Now, immediately, Jesus puts them in a boat and says, you go across to Bethesda, prepare the next place. I'll dismiss the crowd. So they take off in the boat. Jesus goes up on the hill. He dismisses the crowd. He takes some time to pray. Evening comes. He looks out, and the disciples haven't gone anywhere because the wind's against them. So Jesus doesn't do anything. He hangs out. All night till like 4 a.m. 4 a.m. He looks out. They still haven't gone anywhere. So he goes out on the lake and he's walking past them. And they see him and they think he's a ghost and they cry out. And he goes over to comfort them and says, guys, calm down. It's just me. He gets into the boat and immediately everything dies down. And it says the disciples were amazed for they did not understand about the loaves. They didn't get it. If this was a test, they failed it. Their hearts were hardened. When Jesus said to them, you feed them, they did not get it. They did not understand about the loaves. So when Jesus said, you feed them, what did he mean? Well, Mark gives us two options. The first option comes from a passage a few parts earlier in, the, in the, his book, in the Gospel of Mark, where he's out preaching and he's in a large crowd and he gives a few simple farming tips. This is what happens when you put seed on the ground. Here's what happens when you put it on the path. Here's what happens when you put it on fertile soil. And then he sits down. And everyone's like, I thought this was a great teacher. What's the farming tips for? <laughs> and after a few minutes, they start leaving when he doesn't say anything else. And soon everybody leaves, and the only ones left are the disciples. And they're like, uh, Jesus, what did you mean by that? Ah, you have the secret of the kingdom. To everyone else I speak in parables, lest they turn and be saved, but you have the secret. What's the secret? What's the difference? What's the only thing the disciples had everyone else didn't? They stayed. They asked questions. They came back to Jesus. Jesus wants relationship. This is why he teaches in parables. He wants people to come to him and say, can you help me understand this? That's the secret of the kingdom. So one option is Jesus wanted the disciples to ask questions. The second option is Jesus wanted the disciples to do what he did. Shake down the kid, take his lunch, thank God for it, and pass it out. <laughs> the problem, both of these options have problems. If it's the secret of the kingdom, that whole story has the theme of insider versus outsider that Mark, the gospel writer, doesn't bring into this passage. So it's a literary jump to think he's trying to talk on the same theme. The option of do what Jesus did is he hasn't multiplied food before. He hasn't given them authority to multiply food. So it's a question he hasn't told them the material for yet. So it's an unfair question unless there's something in the Old Testament where God expects his leaders to do something he hasn't even told them they could do. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, the, Moses has just completed doing the 10 plagues. Pharaoh's finally relented. And he's released the people from their slavery. They're going out into the wilderness to worship God. And God pulls Moses aside and said, okay, here's the game plan. Don't go this way because if you go this way, you're going to hit a, a war. My people aren't ready for that. Go this way. I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's going to come after you. But don't worry. I'm going to take care of everything. You guys are going to be okay. So Moses starts going this way. Sure enough, soon they hit the Red Sea. They turn around. And yes, just like God said, there is dust in the background. Pharaoh has mounted up his chariots and he's coming back to get his slaves. And the people of Israel lose it. They start crying out. They have lose all faith that God or Moses can do anything. Was it because there were not enough graves in Egypt, they said, that you brought us out here to die in the wilderness? We told you, Moses, we would rather be slaves in Egypt than corpses in the desert. They lose all faith that God or Moses can do anything. Now Moses, who's not a very confident leader... Right? God calls him and he says, I can't speak, don't send me, send someone else. Moses starts writing the Psalms. Be still and wait on the Lord, he says to the people. If you cry out to God today, the enemies you see now, you will never be bothered by again. All you have to do is wait on the Lord. This is literally what David writes in the Psalms just a few hundred years later. What's fascinating is the very next verse. 
Because God doesn't rebuke the people. God rebukes Moses. What are you crying out to me for? Stand up, lift up your staff, turn around and part the Red Sea. What are you doing on your knees? They're coming. You're going to get killed down there. You saw what I did with that staff in Egypt. Stand up and take it out for a test drive. What else does it do? God is rebuking Moses for not coming up with the idea of parting the Red Sea himself. That should terrify you. So when Jesus said to the disciples, you feed them, he expected them to do what he did. When they didn't get it, he did it for them. Then he gave them another command, cross the lake. They're rowing against the wind. Jesus knew this. He waits. Evening, they haven't gone nowhere. He waits till 4 a.m. They still haven't figured it out. So 4 a.m., he's like, I guess they need another demo. So he goes out on the lake. Remember, he's not going to help them. He meant to pass them by. He's walking past like, guys, this is what you do. <laughs> the wind's blowing. Stand up, get out and walk. You've seen me do this before. At least calm the seas. You've seen me do that before. They don't get it. They don't get it that when Jesus gives you a command, he's giving you the authority, the permission to complete that action. But there's a hitch. And this hitch is why we don't see more people walking on water today. This hitch is why we don't see more people feeding thousands of people with a Lunchable. There's a reason why we don't see people parting the Red Sea today. Because what does Jesus say when he gives his disciples authority? Lay down your power. It's not an option. I have 20000 in my checking account or I can ask God to multiply the bread. No, I'm sure if the disciples had $20,000, Jesus would have let them spend that on food. The authority of God comes when you lay down your power, when you empty yourself, when you go out with nothing like a sheep among wolves. That is when God gives you his authority. And this is the reason why the church in America does not see the authority of God is because we never, ever, ever lay down our power. We don't do it. It is a theological sin in our nation if you ever have to pray for your daily bread. You have done something wrong if you are in a position where you need to pray for your daily bread. Jesus would never be allowed to speak on almost any of our pulpits. Because he breaks all of our rules. So I understood this. This is about eight years ago when this finally dawned on me. And I said, okay, God. This is life-changing. How do you do this? How do you do it? How do you make it work? I, I was preaching in a sermon one time. We had about 50 people in the room. I had a few tortillas with me. And I called a young man up, and I gave him the tortillas, and I said, here, feed everybody. He's like, what? I said, feed everybody. He had three tortillas about this big. He's like, okay. So he went around the room and everyone got a piece this big. It got smaller and smaller and smaller. I was the last person. I got a crumb. I said, is that how you think Jesus did it? And it doesn't tell, but is that how he did it? Well, later the, gospel, the, the, the writers of the Bible talk about emptying yourself. I think the way Jesus did it is he ripped that first piece in half. He passed it out, grabbed the second one, ripped it in half, passed it out, grabbed the third one, ripped it in half, passed it out, leaned back. There was a fourth one. Ripped it in half, passed it out. There was a fifth one. Grabbed it in half, lifted it. He continued emptying himself, and it was as he emptied himself that God gave him the authority to feed everybody. The fear that we have is we never empty ourselves. We never give the last little bit. We, ne we always hold on. Who here has fundraised for a mission when you have money in your checking account? Who has asked people for money when you have a retirement savings? We never empty ourselves. 
Because we believe if you have to ever literally depend on God, you have done something wrong. And God's like, no, come on, this is what I'm waiting for. This is what I want to do. Come on, really depend on me. Really lay down your power. So I began thinking, I have to change the way I pray because nine-tenths of my prayers are asking God for power. God gives me a command, do this, and I'm just like the disciples. Okay, God, that's 20 months of a man's wages. I need $20,000. I start praying for $20,000. Well, the problem is most of the heroes of the faith never ask God for money, and even less often does God give money as a result of being asked for it. So I pray for my money. It doesn't come. God comes back a few months later and says, hey, how's that work going? Well, you never gave me my money. <laughs> Praying for power makes me disobedient. So I began changing the way I pray. I said, okay, I'm going to change the way I pray. Rather than praying for power, I'm going to rephrase every prayer as a request for authority. Instead of the power, the money, to feed my children and clothe my family, I'm going to ask for the authority to be the father and the husband you've called me to be. Yes. Instead of praying for the power to fund this mission trip and do this work, I'm going to pray for the authority to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, the thing I'm fighting against is this notion in American Christianity that a mature believer, a mature believer is not someone who has effective prayers. A mature believer is someone who's able to articulate why God didn't answer your prayer. Well, he wants you to be sick right now. He's using this. If Jesus would have said that once, I would go along with it. But he never said that. Everyone who came to Jesus for healing got healed. Now, I know I'm never going to bat a thousand like Jesus, but I'm just trying to increase my average. I learned that when I start praying for authority instead of power, my average goes up. I learned that when I start praying for authority, when I pray for power, I'm usually waiting for something to happen. When I start praying for authority, I'm putting my foot out the boat and I'm trying to figure out what's the next step. And nine times out of ten, the first few steps have nothing to do with power. And then by the time I get to the point where I need power, God does something I don't even expect. The problem is, is I treat God like he's a banker. And I know how bankers solve problems. But God's not a banker, he's a creator. And creators and bankers problem solve completely differently. Once I started praying for authority, I realized I don't know God at all. I would try to build a bridge over the river. I wouldn't think about parting the Red Sea. I would take out a loan to feed the people. I wouldn't think about just passing out what I have. We have been trained in our colonial Christianity to treat God like he's a banker, and God is not a banker. He is a creator. This is why the psalmist says, because your ways are higher than my ways and your thoughts than my thoughts, and I have no idea what you're thinking, God. And this is what I want to encourage you to do, because I know every single one of you, day after day, you have to pray for your daily bread, you are in an impossible situation, and you don't know what to do next, and if you are anything like me, you are spending most of your time asking God for power. I want to challenge you. Quit asking God for power. When it comes to power, when it comes to money, Jesus freely says, God freely says over and over in the scriptures, test me in this and see if I'm not going to provide for you. I started out almost eight years ago testing God by praying for authority instead of power. And I have seen things in the past eight years that I never would have imagined I could have seen. I have experienced the side of God's character I never would have imagined I could ever experience. And I have had the freedom to go down in humility with the people on our reservation, with the urban poor where we live in D.C. now, and to say, I'm in this with you. So often, the gospel that we bring to the urban poor is the gospel of the middle class. I'm on the board of the CCBA. I challenge our board. If you know John Perkins, he's a wonderful man, has a great ministry. 
he tells the story frequently that he is a third grade dropout who went on to start a national organization with a global platform. I challenge our board and I say, in our leadership structure, in what we're doing, is John Perkins an exception or the rule? Do we believe our organization can be led by another third grade dropout? Or do we need someone who's risen up out of this with a good education and a good degree and a lot of wealthy network friends? We have to think we are following God differently. When you pray for power, your vision is only as big as your bank account and the bank account of your 10 richest friends. When you pray for authority, your vision is unlimited because God can do whatever he wants. So brothers and sisters, my relatives, I challenge you tomorrow morning, wake up, watch the sunrise, and remember that you don't worship a banker, you worship a creator. Train yourself to stop asking for money and power and begin to ask this creator to give you authority and begin the practice now of divesting yourself, of giving away your power, of emptying yourself, because I guarantee you on the truth of scripture, if you do that, you will see God do amazing things like you never imagined he could do. Thank you very much. It's been great to be with you today.